Punjab erupted in horrible violence and that same year we had the disaster in Bhopal. So I decided to look at, you know, why is agriculture done in this way? Why do we need these pesticides? What was the Green Revolution? Because I, I was tra trained as a physicist and I didn't know all this at all. So I did a study and then a book for the United Nations called The Violence of the Green Revolution. Because of that book I started to get invited to various places. And one of the meetings was a biotechnology meeting in 1987 before the commercialization of GMOs and genetically engineered foods. And the industry was organizing itself. So I'd done the Green Revolution study and everything I read tracked back to the war. That these chemicals came out of the war. So Rachel Carson has written about it in Silent Spring. That industry that got in the habit of making profits selling chemicals that kill, continued it through agrichemicals. Albert Howard, who's called the father of modern organic farming, has written it. Also, in his book, The Agricultural Testament, of which we have copies available for sale. So all these people who were working at that period in the 1930s saw how out of the war these chemicals were moving into agriculture. And reading all of that stuff for the book on the Green Revolution, I saw those things. Now they were getting organized to control the seed through genetic engineering. They said, we have to do genetic engineering because now we can claim we've said, invented something new and now we can claim ownership and patenting. Because money through royalty collection on seed will be our biggest source of profits in the future. We have to make sure no farmer can save seeds and that all seed is patented and genetically modified. This was 87. There was no seed that was genetically modified then, but they'd already decided. And they'd worked out how many trillions of dollars would flow to them for royalty from seeds that evolved in nature, were bred further by farmers, and all they did was put one toxic gene into it and claim all of evolution, all of farmers' breeding, and all of the future. And I just found it so wrong. I said, got to save the seed. <laughs> and I got to save the seed. And I was very inspired by Gandhi, because you're doing a lot of uh, reflection on that. Part of it was when these companies talked about controlling the food and health. You know, the first thing was I felt a chill. I said, you know, my God, what a total dictatorship over life. Never had such a dictatorship. Hitler was in Nazi Germany. Mussolini was in Italy. You know, you got a little dictators, but there's a place where it ends, the dictatorship. And here was a dictatorship without end, both in space, that the whole world would be controlled, and in time, forever in the future. Yeah? Because when they scramble the seed, they scramble for the future. They, they're literally stealing the future. So the first thing was a real scare and a fear. And then I went, I thought of Gandhi and how in the British Empire, you know, here was Gandhi pulled out a spinning wheel to deal with that empire. So I worked in my mind, worked, 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 what would be the spinning wheel in this whole owning of life and industrializing life. And that's how I thought of the seed, as the spinning wheel. So in my early writings, it was always the seed and the spinning wheel. And when we wrote our report of 20 years of Navdanya, that was the title, The Seed and the Spinning Wheel. But that's one side of it. The other side of it is, Gandhi also gave us the legacy of saying no to injustice mm -hmm. and unjust law. And he practiced it the first time on a September the 11th, 1906, in South Africa, where the regime was trying to divide people by race and requiring compulsory registration. He said, we will not register our race. We are equal citizens. And he started, first time he created the word Satyagraha, the fight for truth. Satya 
is truth. Agra is the force and fight for truth. 1906, against the apartheid regime. They came to India, and some of our old freedom fighters insisted they come to Bihar, where there was compulsory planting of indigo for the blue dye. And farmers couldn't grow food. They had to grow indigo. They were starving themselves. And there's a very famous story that uh, Gandhi was going door to door to talk to people. And there was an old woman who came out of her hut. And he talked to her. Then he said, is there anyone else? She said, yes, my daughter-in-law. He said, bring her out. He said, she can't. I have to go in, take, give her the sari, and then she'll come out because we have one sari between two of us. And then he said, these are the people running the textile industry and have no clothes for themselves. Yeah. This morning I had a, uh, the head of NPR was visiting, wanted to talk, understand about why I saved seed. She's just come from Bengal. She's saying, oh, I heard everywhere there's a scarcity of potato in Bengal. I said, the problem is Bengal is the capital of potato growing. But all the potato is being grown for Pepsi's Lay's chips. So nothing reaches people anymore. So it's not a scarcity of potato. It's a diversion of potato into the industrial profit machine. And no matter how much is produced, it will always be too little. And that's how scarcity gets created. That's how global hunger is created. Because most of the food grain is not being eaten for food. It's going for biofuel, it's being used for animal feed. It's not food. Or it's being processed. So you never see the food itself. And um, so you get scarcity manufactured all the time, all the time, all the time. And the women not having saris in the heart of where the dye for uh, clothing is made. Yeah. And Gandhi then basically worked with the people and said, let's stop cultivating indigo. And slogans came out of that area, we'd rather die than plant indigo. And that was the Champaran Satyagraha, because Champaran was where he had set up the ashram. And then there was a very famous uh, Satyagraha in, um, in Gujarat on land taxes, which are very important because wherever right now there's a structural adjustment going on, the new tax is being put on ordinary people. On, I mean, I have friends who are in deep crisis, the organic farmers, maybe five acre land, could make a living, they weren't greedy, suddenly there's a tax. You're in Greece, you're in Italy, you can't live anymore. There's no job in the city to migrate to either. Yeah? So this whole thing, you won't pay these taxes. He started that. And then the salt laws of 1930, where the British tried to impose the law that said only the British could make salt. Because with the hot temperature here, we need a lot of salt, because we lose a lot of salt. So salt is vital to survival. If you notice, the poor people will have a bit of salt and a chapati. That's it. And Gandhi walked to the sea and said, nature gives it for free. And we've always made salt. We'll continue to make salt. Sorry, we won't obey your law. We took inspiration from that. And when I started Navdanya, that was the first pledge I took. I said, nature gives seeds to us. Our ancestors have bred them. And we won't obey these laws. So salt satyagra to seed satyagra. And we've done that from the beginning to now, and we've stopped all bad laws in this country. And now Navdani is transferring this to other countries where they're hitting. Europe, all of Europe we're having to train. Because there's a new law that would make all local seed illegal. All heritage seed would be banned. Except that which is approved by Brussels. And Africa, all of Africa is going to have one law on the seed. Again, the same. And the language is identical. You know, in early days, I used to deal with World Bank, and they'd say, oh, but you know, we are not imposing it. Gujarat government wanted it. Maharashtra government wanted it. Karnataka government wanted it. And I was looking at all these projects of social forestry. I said, it's very interesting that every proposal is identical. And we are diverse. We don't even speak the same language in each of these states. So when it's that uniform, it's not coming from within that state. It's coming from you. And it's the same with these laws, it's identical language. And we were talking earlier about, you know, we've known all this before. And 
I, I look at all the literature, the word seed doesn't exist anymore. If movements like Navdanya didn't exist, seed would be forgotten. First it became intellectual property, right? So there's no seed, it's Monsanto's intellectual property. As if intellectual property is property in the products of the mind. You can see it popped out of Monsanto's mind. I'm fighting a case in the High Court of um, Andhra Pradesh where the government said you're charging too much for seed and they put a ceiling. And it's under our Essential Commodities Act. Monsanto's suing them and saying this is not a seed. So how can you put a seed price? This is not about seed, it's about a technology trade. And everyone sort of got convinced, you know. So I'm having to say, no, the technology trade can't be in the sky. Yeah. It's a bit like Portia telling Shylock, okay, you can have your pound of flesh, but no blood. <laughs> you know? So they behave as if this, their pound of flesh, the technology trade, is not in the sea. In the you know, European law, in the new African law, and this has all happened in the last two months, it's suddenly plant propagating material. Plant propagating material. And then if you look at the criteria, the criteria is good plant propagating material for industry. So we don't, you know, no oranges that we can eat straight should be good for making juices. Yeah? No potatoes that you can cook. They should be good for frito -lay chips. So it's all, food is becoming industrial raw material. And that's why there's a competition between the de limitless demands of industry and the limited demands for food. But obviously food is required by ordinary people, most of whom are poor. Industry is not just able to generate profits, it's able to collect subsidies. $400 billion for the industrial agriculture system. And in the U.S., I was there in a room. Prashad was also there. We were having a conference. And I think Bill Sark is your secretary of agriculture. And he was asked, you know, we're going to the new farm bill, and there's a growth of hungry people because of the economic crisis. So how will you enlarge the food stamp? And you know what he said? And, and how much will you cut out the agribusiness subsidies? He said, we will not touch agribusiness subsidies. And food stamps are all about fake hunger. We're going to have to cut back. And they have cut back. I don't know how many other additional million will not get food anymore in the US. So you know, this is how the scarcity issue gets created. What we do with the schools is, as I said, the first is a very basic thing, a garden. But linked to that, is a deeper relationship with the earth yeah. at every level, at every level, you know, the intellectual, the emotional, the psychological, the practical, uh, because I think the problem has been the fragmentation. And all our education has been, again, turning human beings into raw material for a global industrial system. So if you look at the flashy departments, they're only biotechnology, information technology, and business management. As if we don't need young people who learn music, young people who learn languages, young people who learn all the other things that need to be learned. And I mean, can you imagine all the generations of the future being business managers, biotechnologists, and information technologists? No skills for living. So the farm and our programs with schools are skills for living, uh, initiatives for living. And talk to Satish. Satish and I do a course every year in Spain, in Mallorca. It used to be soil source society, his favorite trinity. And now it's become education for life because they're having cutbacks there. The teachers are losing jobs. Schools are closing down. And through these programs, we are sort of working with the teachers. And how can you, how can the community keep education alive and the state abandons it. After all, com education used to be a community initiative. So I come from Uttaranchal. I'll give you two little stories. 
So Uttaranchal, the women fought for education. They created their own schools. And then they demanded that these schools be recognized. Today they cry. They say, we thought schools would educate our children. And what they've done is create useless people who, are, who think farming is inferior, but they're not educated enough to go into a fancy job. So they're useless for that world and they're useless for this world. And they just sit around and hang around and an 85-year-old mother is doing the farming and feeding them. So basically, it, it's an education of de-skilling. Yeah? And what we've done there is a very beautiful program where we, we call it the Community Biodiversity Registers. We get the grandmothers who know, know how to read and write to work with the children to teach them what different aspects of biodiversity do, what's used for medicine, which food crop does what, which tree has what healing properties. And the grandmothers are just full of it. They know every species. And now we're creating these biodiversity registers so that the future generations are able to receive this knowledge, which has been blocked out for them from the formal education system. Yeah? And the second story is, you know, my, my own grandfather was very troubled that girls weren't going to school. So he started the first school for girls in his area. And then it was doing so well, he wanted it to become a college. And he wanted a recognition of this as a college. And those were Gandhian days. Everyone went on a fast for a social purpose. You know? So he went on a fast for a social purpose. The president arrived one day after he died to recognize it as a college. In the meantime, of course, he'd given his life. So, you know, when think of it, what we have as education was built by the community. And then the state took the public responsibility. And now we are in this process, as we were talking, of privatization of education and health and everything else, which means kids can only study with loans. You know, you can only get treated with a loan. Uh, farmers can only grow crops with a loan. Everything has become linked to debt. Everything has become linked to debt. And in agriculture, it has meant 284,000 suicides in India because of indebtedness. And it's something we work on, we monitor, we go to these places, we actually we do the documentation. And it's, it's fascinating. And you know, for me, science is about truth. And compassion is an obligation. And so for me, telling the true story of the suicide is, is just my basic being. But because we monitored the suicides from day one and show the connections with the monopolies on the cotton, 95% cotton is owned by Monsanto in India now. The seed. 95%. And and they're charging 8000 percent more for the seed than the cost used to be before they monopolized. And their seeds are so unreliable, they fail, and they've destroyed every other alternative. There's no farmer's seed, there's no public seed, there's only Monsanto seed. And that's what they're working towards, no alternative, no alternative, no alternative. As a result of which, farmers get into deep debt and can't pay back. And uh, earlier debt used to be public debt. You know, like in the Green Revolution, it was government that said, take the credit and we'll give you the fertilizer and seed. So when it became too costly and the debt was high, the farmers would protest and say, you know, Rin Mukti Andolan. Remember how much Rin Mukti Andolan we used to have? So, but when you borrowed from one individual agent of a seed company and he's after you and saying your land is now mine, you haven't paid the debt, you don't fight back because you're an individual now, you're no more the community and you don't organize, you don't protest. So that's one of the big things, and you should see the number of papers planted in the highest journals, nature and science and new scientists and scientific American, trying to counter this link between suicides and, uh, and the monopoly on seed, now a monopoly through genetically modified seed. So I think part of the new learning really is the ability, the training the mind to make the connections. 
Because once the mind is trained to make the connections, then the mind will make the connections. And to me, you know, that's Gregory Bateson's legacy. It was always about seeing in the whole. Seeing in the whole. You know? I remember a very funny one he had about the, I think it was about the horse. You make the horse grow big, but then you haven't taken into consideration that the poor horse's circulation goes wrong. Everything goes wrong. And a bigger horse won't survive. Won't survive. <laughs> you know? And in, in a way, that's what's happening with genetic engineering. It's all falling apart. But they don't allow the knowledge of it falling apart to reach the public. So we've done a report called The GMO Emperor Has No Clothes. You know? That's true. You know, that's so true. So I think this whole, if, if we could shift our education, and we're trying that in our little way through Navania, we could shift the education, one, to for love for the earth. And if you start early enough, there's no child who doesn't love the earth if they're given the opportunity. Okay, the point is, yes, it's true that concrete is all over. But there are schools here so enthusiastic, they set up pots. Yeah. So we'll have a garden in pots. You can create beds, you know, in wood, on the terrace. Um, I know people have started inspired by the seed movement now, doing food in balconies and feeding 50 other families with one balcony. You know, we, we've been made to forget the uh, potential for abundance mm -hmm. through the fear of scarcity and the manufacture of scarcity. You know, like Noam Chomsky wrote the book, The Manufacture of Dissent. Well, the dominant economic system is the manufacture of scarcity. Yeah. And for the seed, I always say, for the millets, one seed can give you a million. And that one of a million can give you another million. Look at the exponential growth. Why should we have hunger? Why should we have seed scarcity? And when Santa comes in and says, no, you can't have seed, you can't save seed, and they create a scarcity that farmers are committing suicide. You know? So you can just see the most dramatic ways in which this is being done. And for education, love for the earth and love for each other, and the ability to connect. You know? I think if, if we can transmit that possibility to future generations, then there's hope. I think we undermine the capacity to connect a yes. hundred years at least before the crisis that this has brought on. Yes. That the development of education in separate departments, cut up in little pieces, yes. analytical, reductionist, leads to the failure of imagination. Absolutely. So if you were around, we're doing a conference, but you'll be gone on um, reimagining the human nature relationship, mm -hmm. learning from disasters. We were asked to organize the conference on disasters. And I said, you know, we don't want to just take count how many died, how much. Uh, no, we want to say, what do you learn from this? What the, did the communities who went through it learn from it? You know? And reimagining the relationship. And also reimagining the relationship between the generations. Which is so important. Because essentially, a ge one generation worth of knowledge has been lost. But there's still living people that remember. Absolutely. Many. So one of the things we've started is something called the Grandmother's University. Bravo. Precisely ah. for that remembering. <laughs> and we were just talking what the next year's Grandmother's University should be. What do you see, Catherine, with a concept like Grandmother's University? What would be your early thoughts on something like this? Let's see that. Well, about 10 years ago, I started to create a movement called Granny Voter wow. in the United States. And the concept was essentially that we are making very short-term decisions. How, how can we persuade officials, government agencies to think long term, to think of the implications for 50 years from now, yes, let's yes. say? How do people think about the future? So my thought was, if we said to everyone who had a 
a grandchild or a great niece or great nephew or had taught students in a class. Think of the children that you love and make decisions for the world in which they will raise their children. Um, now that's using grandparenthood to think ahead. But we can also use grandparenthood to think, to get the wealth of knowledge from the past, to use the memory. And this, I'm sure most of you know, has been demonstrated is that in animals, not just human beings, but animals that live in communities, herds and so on, flocks, that the presence of post-reproductive grandparents in the herd, a few old female deer, well, makes a difference in how many of the newborn survive. Because they, they're there with advice and memory. So we have to combine, you see, foresight and memory in a new way. Yeah. Which is actually what Anna's thing I have to write the forward. We have this colleague who's a nutritionist and uh, she's Indian but she lives in Rome and she comes to teach at our courses and she just sent me a new book to write a foreword for and the book is called Kal and she says in, in Hindi Kal means both the past and the future and we have to link the two it's yeah. the separation of the past to the future that is also at the root because it's another fragmentation and what is a seed? Yeah, it's a memory it, it is a memory and a prediction yes, yes, mm. yes, 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 yes. <laughs> southwest of England, which is my family. So we're now in the third coming, the fourth generation, and they have all changed, and they've never been organic in that sense, um, and have never felt the need to be organic, but have felt the need to be very aware of their environment and to protect it and support it and, and nourish it um, and I worry that in a place like that for, for everybody to be organic would make food for the people that I'm working with in London so that there's the connection almost impossible to, to buy now, in this group, I'm feeling very brave to say that, to, to actually say, that can this be done without being organic? And I'm sure I'm going to be shot down in flames. But I carry my family's story, and it's very dear to me, and, and my great nephew is gonna take on the farm from my sister, and her, his children will take on, you know, so there is a long history of change and development but never taking away that belief that we were simply custodians of the land which is what my father and grandfather were very keen for us to know and yet organic was not something that they felt the need to be well i'm sure the grandfather would have been organic they were organic well, they didn't have to see the right. need to be <laughs> was not organic then. Yeah, but I think that's where our contemporary reality, you know, we have to sort of look at it and see. Um, because so often what's treated as a free choice, you know, that farmer who go, gets locked into the BT cotton, it's presented as free choice and it's always argued and therefore they took it. I've done all the research. No, they took BT cotton because there was no choice left. Yeah. Now all of the spread of chemicals has been done through a policy push. Governments, the industry got the governments to give the subsidies to make this more viable. Okay, so farmers became chemical because it, they, it brought more money to them. Not because it was essentially more productive, 
and it was definitely not more profitable, but the subsidies changed the equation. Yeah. Now, the second thing is, we were always told that it's because of higher production and it's about food security and hunger. At least two of the reports of Navdania where we've gone to our farmers and just measured what they produce. And one of our um, reports is called Health Per Acre, where we are measuring nutrition per acre and food per acre. It's much, much, much more in small biodiverse organic farms. But what is measured in the industrial farms is this. You push the farmers and lock them into buying things. It's a bit like pushing the student into getting that loan. Yeah? Get the farmers loan. You've got to have, like in Eastern Europe, they're saying one cow is illegal, unsafe for your health. You milk it the hands. You've got to have 50 and have machines. And they all these health measures. So they just force you to borrow and borrow and borrow for chemicals, for machinery, for seeds, etc. Yeah, but the chemicals, the fact that you're getting chemicals, even that comes at a subsidized level. So the farmer ends up being a consumer of these what I call external inputs. And then in order to pay back for this, because now the farmer can't afford to eat, the farmer must pay back, so they have to grow a commodity which they can sell in order to pay back. Which is why most of the hungry people of the world are producers of food. I also read um, that, uh, that the company, large companies were um, it kind of squeezing the farmer because, let's say, I have a plot of land here, and then the neighbor begins using chemicals, and this neighbor begins using chemicals, and this then it, it destroys the balance in my, and then I almost have to use it because the chemicals are coming over, destroying the balance I'm creating in my yeah. plot. Absolutely. And I'm squeezed in. Yeah. And now with genetic engineering, because I'm growing organic potato and someone else is going chemical uh, yeah. BT, and it contaminates. Okay. I'm growing yeah. granola, it contaminates. Mm -hmm. So that's it's a so new hard. level of pollution. Mm -hmm. One was chemical and now is the genetic. So the farmers locked into just having to keep paying back, so they grow more and more commodities and less and less food. And that is why organic becomes costlier because there's a subsidy for production and then there's all of these facilities given to the monoculture, the commodity, the large scale, the long distance and all of that. And that's what makes organic look like a luxury. But from the perspective of the earth, Organic is not a luxury. From the perspective of society, it's not a luxury. Yeah, It's been made to artificially look like a luxury. And, and I also wonder if it really serves your family. I know I grew up in a, on a farm family, a dairy farm, and my father bought into it and um, used fertilizers, used antibiotics and cows um, and in the end he had to sell his herd to the government buyout program um, because the huge farms were, were um, giving their the cows the what was it they give to the BGH the yeah BGH he couldn't compete compete with that um, and so he went out of business his heart was broken and I think that the piece that you speak about so well is the importance of seeing the need for compassion and um, the heartbreak that happens in this too, that your family is probably struggling as a very small farm family well, and there's heartbreak there. And if you can see a two acre farmer becoming unviable, then tomorrow the five acre farmer will right. become unviable and the next year the 20 acre farmer will become unviable. And if today five stores went out of business, then tomorrow 50, 20 will go out of business. And we've got to start projecting to see the trends. And it's only with that kind of capacity to project and look ahead. You know, I think Dag Hammarskjöld is the one who said, humanity has lost its capacity to anticipate. And that is what will drive humanity to extinction. Because if we don't anticipate, then we can't make the turn early enough to avoid the dead end, you know? That throughout the history of the human race, a very large proportion of the population has been engaged in creating food. Yeah. <clears throat> and what we're doing now 
partly with the subsidies and chemicals and so <coughs> on, is creating industrial jobs for people who are no longer growing food and forcing the farmers to support the industries that are producing the chemicals. Um, Part of the difficulty with economics, you know, is we count the number of transactions that happen. It's, it's money moving that is regarded as prosperity. Yeah. Not having enough, that's not prosperity. And so you just add all these different steps and transactions, you create a whole set of jobs that are essentially unnecessary. Um, and it looks like prosperity, it's an illusion. Absolutely. In fact, we did a rough sum. That even in the most industrialized societies, 50% people are involved in the food system, but not on the land, not in growing food, but in destroying food, either through spraying pesticides or in the Walmart system or driving a Walmart truck or processing, but it's all taking real value out of the food. And that's where most of the jobs are. Yeah? But it's still 50%. So if we look at the food system and not people on the land, you know, we still have to have 50% people taking care of the food needs of society. You can either make a choice that those 50% are engaged in looking after the earth, producing good and healthy food, and creating good community, or the 50% are involved in destroying the earth, creating bad food, and destroying community, you know? Mm -hmm. I should say that. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> yes. Food is the, a core issue here, yes. but it, the implications yes. involve all of life. All of all life. Of life. Mm -hmm. Because food is life. Mm -hmm. Food is life. Can I ask one question? You had mentioned three movements. And you got to I second. Stopped at the two. Yeah. Yes. I have what a was the third? To do <laughs> <laughs> what is the third? Just to yeah. complete uh, that point. Which is actually exactly um, what Catherine has just raised. <laughs> oh. So the movement called Bhumi. We do an annual festival, but we get the children. Uh, you know, I'm part also of the group that started talking about the rights of Mother Earth, Eva Morales, the Bolivians, and we drafted a universal declaration on the rights of Mother Earth, and we we get children to be part of this movement of the living earth. So building community, but building community as an earth community. That we humans are not separate from the earth. We are part of the earth. Now, that to me is the biggest separation that we've created and every problem looks impossible to solve. But the minute you are part of the earth, in a very easy way, we can solve problems that we face. So for example, Navdanya's work in food shows that the more we conserve space for other species, the more food we produce for ourselves. Not because we wanted to produce more food for ourselves, but the first step was to make sure there are enough butterflies and bees and earthworms and soil organisms. And once they're there, they give you so much food. You know, they give you more food. And this idea that we're going to have more food, therefore kill the butterflies, kill the bugs, kill the insects, kill the earthworms, is actually shrinking the productive capacity of the earth. So a living earth, and I call it the intellectual level earth democracy, but it's really Bhumi, the earth, as a living, generous, giving mother, and for children to be aware of this. And, and that shift as, you know, because in any way, you know, the children are facing a dead end situation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they can see the system collapsing around them. I mean, can you imagine the young kids who had participated in the labeling fight in California and Washington? How will they be feeling right now? You know, democracy doesn't work anymore. So we need to now make a quantum leap to be able to go beyond this corporate control for a new imagination, as Catherine was saying. Because I, I don't think our chances for survival can even exist without a new imagination. Yeah? And seeding that imagination as members of the Earth community really become. And we have a lovely word in Hindi, in Sanskrit for it, Vasudheva Kutumbakam. Vasundra is the earth as a goddess. Vasundra, Vasudheva 
Kutumkam is the family, the family of the earth.